for uh, throwing a New Year's event that we don't have to drive all the way down to LA for it and with a spectacular line. <laughs> that, yeah, you're welcome. It's something we've been wanting to do for years, New Year's show, and just haven't done it. And we talked about it last year and the year before, and um, things went so good the last couple of Oracle shows, and we're like, let's do it, let's do it. Let's do a pop on New Year's Eve, and here we are one day away, and things are getting exciting back there, and things are starting to get built, and can't be more thrilled. Tell us a little bit about yourself before you became, you know, dilute. You know, how did you get to where you are today? I moved up here to go to college, um, San Francisco State. I lived in Southern California in South Orange County, and that's where I grew up and um, where my real home is, even though I've lived up here for so long. And after San Francisco, during San Francisco State, um, my friend Tom and I wanted to throw an event. I used my financial aid, he sold his car, and we threw a rave. It was pretty reckless of us. We both had jobs, so, you know, we were still able to pay for school, and luckily that event sold out, and we did another one, and another one, and another one, and right place at the right time, and trance and sound were the two things that were most important to us. And um, here we are today, like over 50, 16 years later, and just feel so lucky to be able to keep on doing this and to see trance grow as much as it has. Tell us what it really inspired you in those first few events. What inspired you to start all of a sudden throwing parties? Well, just becoming a raver. Um, when I was in high school, there were maybe like two ravers in my high school. This was like in like 93, 92, 93. And my friend was like, you should go to this rave, you should go to this rave. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to go to a rave. I'm going to go to hip hop. And I'm going to go to a punk show. And, you know, I was like, I was so not open to it. And finally she took me and I went and like people were coming up to me, hugging me and like, being, hey, what's up? How are you? What's your name? Something that I didn't really see at any other shows. And I was just blown away. That's what captivated me at first was just how nice everybody was. And this was down in L.A. Um, it didn't come for years later that I really like started to find the music that I loved the most and fall in love with, you know, that, that kind of thing. It was more just going with my friends and having a good time every weekend and we were like the outcasts of our high school because there were only like three of us. So looking back over the years, you know, um, you've seen so many different trends in dance music, you know, especially mm -hmm. from smaller parties to large parties. Uh, what have you seen some of the biggest changes in trends to the dance scene? The infusion of the other genres, like house and electro and dubstep. I mean, first it was house, progressive, sort of started to fuse into trance. And I think it, um, it when the electro movement came and just blew up, um, that was huge for trance. Because from an event organizer standpoint, from an outside perspective, I noticed a lot of people, the newer generation was were moving away from trance and getting into like things that gave them what they wanted right away, you know, like on the dance floor and things that didn't take a long time to progress. And there were all these new exciting things coming out. So that fusion was a huge evolution for trance. Um, and I saw like a lot of the DJs putting that into their productions and I, we even do it ourselves with deep voices. And then the dubstep movement changed everything, took everything by storm, like kind of surprised us all on how big and fast it got and it's still growing and some of that's gone into trance too. There's like trance and like house music. You listen to house and I might call it trance and someone might call it house. <laughs> that's true. What are some of the goals for skills in 2013? Any we're gonna have? Yeah. Um, well we're we're gonna focus on Pop the Dream and Pop NYE. And yeah. Um, those are the events that we're able to be the most creative with. And those are the ones we want to focus all our time into. And it takes a lot of time and heart to do those events. And we're a small crew. There's not many of us that do skills. There's just a few of us. And we have, of course, a lot of people that support us. But there's a few of us that work on it every day of the year, seven days a week. And no matter what time of the night it is, if there's something to do, we do it. We love doing it. And we, um, Tim and Miranda and myself um, are always working on it. So, you know, it's just... For us, it's like we want to keep these events as safe as possible. That's we can't. If the events aren't safe, we're, Skills isn't going to be able to do events anymore, along with other promoters. Educating the fans that there are ways to find help at the events um, is very important, and you know to do things in excess. If you're going to drink, drink some water. Um, there's plenty of staff here. Don't be afraid to put, approach our medical staff. They're here to help. They're not here to like bust you. They're here to make sure that you have a good time and you get home safe. And 
you know, with this new influx of all these new people, these new wonderful people coming into our industry, um, it's thriving and, and that's one of the biggest concerns we have is just keep on educating those people and we put that on our festival guides and on our website and um, try to say that as much as possible. It's just be safe and look out for one another and each other. You know, you rarely get to enjoy yourselves at events because you're working so hard. You know, you're setting up the day before, weeks in advance, months in advance. Um, what do you want people attending your events to experience? You know, what would be a skills event? The whole production, when we design, when we sit and start the production, put a dot on a piece of paper, the, the word that I always start with is beautiful. That's how I want the show to go. And with our programmer, Alan, it's what I tell him, you know, the style, I want things to flow and I want things just to be beautiful. And there's a lot of other words you can derive from that. And that's the most important thing to me and, you know, booking the artists that are like, kind of like the biggest in their own right and the most respected is what we try to go for. We can, we're only doing one room shows, so we have room for five or six DJs. We try to book as much as possible as an eclectic lineup. This one is unique because it's all trance, but a lot of times we have all different kinds of genres in there. We want people to have a great experience. I mean, there's so many things happening at this event that it can be life-changing for people. People can be going through a hard time in life and hear the music and like above and beyond the name group therapy. I mean, just think about that one for a while and watch them play a set for three hours and it is like going to group therapy and it is very healing. And I think these events can have a lot of positive influences on the youth. They are. Going into the next question, and you're going to think about, um, you know, there's so many newcomers, and a lot of times this may be the bigger ones may be their first event. What would you say is kind of the difference between going to smaller events and larger events? Because you've thrown both kinds. We get a lot more new people coming to the event, people that haven't been to an event before. Usually they're not coming alone, they're coming with people that are veterans, so say, um, which is good. You know, it's always good to have some friends around, but um, we see a lot of new people coming to these events, and it, it, it helps feed the smaller events. And, the and then eventually, the people that aren't 21, they turn 21, and it feeds the clubs. And it's this whole symbiotic relationship that just everybody's kind of helping each other, whether you're doing big events, small events, or 21 and up clubs. What was the breaking point in your career where you realized, you know, I'm not going to be going to school, this is going to be my job, and this is what I'm going to be doing for quite a while? Huh. Probably when I dropped out. You <laughs> dropped out. Tell us about that thing. Um, when was it? Gosh. You know, I regret that too, because I went to college for three and a half years, and I took a lot of GAs. I, I, I didn't, I didn't like finish my major. I didn't finish college because I was so focused on doing the events and being a DJ. And I had like two or three jobs at the time as well. I eventually decided, well, I'm just gonna not go to a school semester. And and then we did a show at the Bill Graham. Um, which was a huge step up from the size of shows we were doing before, and that show sold out. And then I, re then I, I made the decision that we're not going to go back to school. Tom and I did, and we're going to open up a record store and try to do a retail store. And we did that for ten years. That was so much fun. What's one thing you wish you would have known before? Before I started doing this job. <laughs> What's one thing you wish you would have known before? That I, I wish I would have known how much of a roller coaster it's going to be, like emotionally. Uh -huh. Um, financially, um, how much stress it, it takes on you. Like, I could talk about the negative things like that. There's so many positive things of being able to run your own schedule and be able to like do these events and have people like leave the event with smiles. And you get like emails and people come up to you and they're like, "Hey, man, that was the best event ever." And that, that kind of positive energy like takes away from sometimes the bad things that go with being an event promoter at this size because it's not like we're all making millions of dollars. There's a lot of there's a lot of things that go into these events, a lot of variables and um, it's like everything's on the line every time and it's very stressful to be responsible for 15,000 people. What's probably been one of the biggest challenges you've had? How did you overcome it and what, were you, what was your action plan? I would say stepping out into the media spotlight. Um, kind of a shy person when it comes to that, you know, making statements when there have been situations in our industry or at our events and having to talk to the media. It's not something that I ever trained to do and it's something that 
I don't really like doing, but it has to be done. Someone has to be a voice. Yeah, and yeah someone's got to do it, and it's, it's kind of scary. Tell us something that you came up with that's unique to skills, you know, at events, you just randomly came up with a new idea. Well, I thought I had lots of new ideas <laughs> when we did them, and then I realized, really, there's never a new idea. There's always someone that did it before you. I thought when we did our first party, when we like did all two by four parties, I, n I didn't think anyone else had ever done that, but you know, I'm sure someone had. Um, the candy thing, I thought we were one of the first people, at least in this, they were doing it in LA, but in San Francisco, no one was really doing candy parties. I think everybody's always like looking to other people for inspiration and people like kind of like for lack of a better word, copy what we're doing in, in different ways, and I look at it as being cool, you know, I think, obviously we had to copy someone. We got the idea of doing what we're doing for someone else many, many years ago, and it's okay. What would you say, you know, organizing all these events, what's the most time-consuming aspect of it? Probably booking the artists. Booking the artists. Yeah. How far it, in advance does that go? Typically, I try to start booking artists out, like, six to eight months in advance and it usually takes anywhere from six weeks to four months to book six artists <clears throat> it's not that we can't book the artists but to get the right lineup together and to book the big DJs that far out with their schedules and their touring schedules and do they want to commit that far out because if they do then they can't play any other club plays before then it's like it's always an exclusive deal and get you know the billing and the set times and it's very complicated, very, uh, it takes a long time, but Always it's just emails, you know, I like, I'll do a few emails in the morning, a few in the afternoon, a few at night, and I do that for months. What is your proudest achievement of skills? It was so cool to have a record store and have people come in and buy tickets and sell tickets and sell records, and I always used to go to record stores and yeah, opening the record store by far. Where do you see skills in the next five years? What do you see changing? Well, I'd really like to get to do events where we could do bigger and better things. Um, it may be, seem hard to believe when you come to these events that we can do that, but there are a lot of stuff that we'd like to add to our shows to, make the, to enhance the experience. When you're dealing with an arena, um, you are limited to a certain amount. You know, I mean, aside from charging like two or three hundred dollars a ticket, there's only so much you can do. But as new technology comes out, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of lights, and a lot of different toys that we like. We wanted to use, and we have been wanting to use, and um, that we will use. What's some of the best advice you've ever gotten when starting uh, skills? What was it, and you know, how did you apply it? Um, keep, keep a good head on your shoulder. Don't let anything get to your head, man. By far, you know. This is, we're all fortunate to be doing what we're doing. This is a privilege. We're, we're lucky. Uh, well, I don't know if lucky, okay, we, we work hard, but um, we have it pretty good to be able to do this as a job. And like, I don't ever forget that. And when, when the kids come up to me and they're, they talk to me, I can remember myself in that place. And, you know, remembering someone tell me that is something I've always kept. We're all normal people, and like some of us are young, some of us are a little older, and just be reachable. What do you do for fun on your own time? Any hobbies that you really enjoy to do? Yeah, I, I love to golf. Love to golf, and I like. Um, I love the beach. I, I've just been getting into surfing lately, but I've been. I come from a bodyboarding background. Ba bodyboarding background forever. From being from Southern California, and uh, I love love the beach. And, I like watching TV and movies. Um, yeah. uh, softball, I play softball and baseball. I play in leagues um, all year round almost, one or two times a week. I love sports. Um, I love watching baseball. I love going to baseball games, go to all these games, seeing the ticket holder. I have lots of hobbies. My wife, I spend as much time with her as she'll let me. <laughs> Papa and is only less than 24 hours away. I know. How excited are you and what do you think is going to be um, the most exciting part of the night? Oh, I'm so excited. I, I I, told myself earlier this week that I surrender. Like, there's things going wrong right now, okay? <laughs> there always are. And I'm not, I'm not going to let them off. It, it's made me more excited for the event because of just to let go. It's like it's hard to let go when you plan something for eight months. <clears throat> 
and one little thing doesn't go right, sometimes you're just like, ah, oh, my whole day's ruined. So I'm not gonna do that. Um, I'm gonna take more time to talk to my friends and hang out with my friends. There's a lot of good friends I have come to our events and I like never get a chance to hang out with them. But the New Year's Eve experience, the countdown, it's a huge responsibility to do a New Year's Eve event, I feel, and it's the first time we've ever done one. We've spent a lot of time, a lot of time on the countdown and planning it out and programming it and it's all synced and we want, I wanted to create an emotional countdown moment. There's eight hours and 55 minutes of hands in your air <coughs> dancing time, but for five minutes I want people to hear and see beauty. What would you say separates you know, the trans family, because there's so many of them out here and trans is one of the biggest things at your events, from just party goers? Trans family knows their music way better, <laughs> for sure. I mean, they know the songs, they sing the songs. I see it. I don't go to all the events, but the ones I do go to, it is very noticeable. And, uh, you know, when, when a big artist comes and plays someone else's song, they know it. And it's just education and music. Love of the music, it's, it shows. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, definitely.